Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 12, Means of Assisting the Souls in Purgatory. No, of all that we can do in favor of the souls in purgatory, there is nothing more precious than the immolation of our divine Savior upon the altar. Besides being the express doctrine of the Church manifested in her councils, many miraculous facts, properly authenticated, leave no room for doubt in regard to this point. We have already spoken of the religious who have delivered from purgatory by the prayers of St. Bernard and his community. This religious, whose regularity was not at all that could be desired, had appeared after his death to ask the assistance of St. Bernard. The holy abbot, with all his fervent disciples, hastened to offer his prayers, fast and masses, for the poor departed brother. The latter was speedily delivered, and appeared full of gratitude to an aged religious of the community who had specifically interested in himself in his behalf, questioned as to the suffrage which he most profited to him. Instead of replying, he took the old man by his hand, and conducting him to the church where Mass was being celebrated, Behold, he said, pointing to the altar, the great redeeming power which has broken my chains. Behold the price of my ransom. It is the saving host, which takes away the sins of the world. Here is another incident related by the historian Ferdinand of Castile, and quoted by Father Rossingiunioli. There was at Cologne, among the students of a higher class of the university, two Dominican religious of distinguished talent, one of whom was a blessed Henry Suso. The same studies, the same kind of life, and above all, the same relish for sanctity, had caused them to contract an intimate friendship, and they mutually imparted the favors which they received from heaven. When they had finished their studies, seeing that they were about to be separated, to return each one to his own convent, they agreed and promised one another that the first of the two who should die should be assisted by the other for a whole year by the celebration of two Masses each week, on Monday a Mass of Requiem, as was customary, and on Friday that of the Passion, on so far as the rubrics would permit. They engaged to do this, gave each other the kiss of peace, and left Cologne. For several years they both continued to serve God with the most edifying favor, the brother, whose name is not mentioned, was the first to be called away, and Suso received the tidings with the most perfect sentiments of resignation to the divine will. As to the contract that they made, time had caused them to forget it. He prayed much for his friend, imposing new penances upon himself and many other good works, but he did not think of offering the Mass which he had promised. One morning, whilst meditating in retirement in the chapel, he suddenly saw appear before him the soul of his departed friend, who regarded him with tenderness, reproached him with having been unfaithful to his word, given and accepted, and which he had a perfect right to rely upon with confidence. Blessed Suso surprised excused his forgetfulness by enumerating the prayers and mortifications which he had offered, and still continued to offer. For his friend, whose salvation was dear to him as his own. Is it possible, my dear brother, he added, that after so many prayers and good works I have offered to God do not suffice for you? Oh no, dear brother, replied the suffering soul, that is not sufficient. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that is needed to extinguish the flames by which I am consumed. It is the august sacrifice which will deliver me from these frightful torments. I implore you to keep your word, and refuse me not that which in justice you owe me. Blessed Suso hastened to respond to the appeal for the suffering soul, and to repair his fault. He celebrated and caused to be celebrated more masses than he promised. On the following day, several priests, at the request of Suso, united with him in offering the holy sacrifice for the deceased and continued this act of charity for several days. After some time the friend of Suso again appeared to him, 
but now in a very different condition. His countenance was joyful and surrounded with beautiful light. Oh, thanks, my faithful friend, he said. Behold, by the blood of my Savior, I am delivered from my sufferings. I am now going to heaven to contemplate him whom we so often adore together under the Eucharistic veil. Suso prostrated himself to thank the God of all mercy, and understood more than ever the inestimable value of the august sacrifice of the altar. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 13 Relief of the Souls We read in the life of St. Elizabeth of Portugal that after the death of her daughter Constance, she learned the pitiful state of the deceased in purgatory and the price which God exacted for her ransom. The young princess had been married but a short time previous to the king of Castile, when she was snatched away by sudden death from the affection of her family and her subjects. Elizabeth had just received these tidings and set out with the king, her husband, for the city of Santurum. When a hermit coming from his solitude ran after the royal cortege, carrying what he wished to speak to the queen. The guards repulsed him, but the saint, seeing that he persisted, gave orders that the servant of God should be brought to her. As soon as she came into her presence, he related that more than once, while he was praying in his hermitage, Queen Constance had appeared to him, urgently entreating him to make known to her mother that she was languishing in the depths of purgatory, that she was condemned to a long and terrible sufferings, but that she would be delivered if, for the space of a year, the holy sacrifice of the Mass was celebrated for her every day. The courtiers, who heard this communication, ridiculed him aloud and treated the hermit as a visionary, an impostor, or a fool. As to Elizabeth, she turned towards the king and asked him what he thought of it. I believe, replied the prince, that it is wise to do that which has been appointed out to you in so extraordinary a manner. After all, to have Masses celebrated for our deceased relatives is nothing more than a paternal and Christian duty. A holy priest, Ferdinand Mendez, was appointed to say the Mass. At the end of the year, Constance appeared to St. Elizabeth, clad in a brilliant white robe. Today, dear mother, she said, I am delivered from the pains of purgatory, and am about to enter heaven. Filled with consolation and joy, the saint went to the church to return thanks to God. There she found the priest Mendez, who assured her that on the previous day he had finished the celebration of the 365 masses with which he had been charged. The queen then understood that God had kept the promise which he had made to the pious hermit, and she testified her gratitude by distributing abundant alms to the poor. But thou hast saved us from them that afflict us, and thou hast put to shame that hate us. Psalm 43 Such were the words addressed to the illustrious St. Nicholas of Tolentino by the souls that he had delivered in offering for them the holy sacrifice of the Mass. One of the greatest virtues of that admirable servant of God, says Father Rossignoli, was his charity, his devotion to the church suffering. For her, he frequently fasted on bread and water, inflicted cruel disciplines upon himself, and wore about his loins a chain of sharp-pointed iron. When the sanctuary has thrown upon him, and his superiors wished to confer the priesthood upon him, he hesitated a long time before that sublime dignity, and nothing could make him decide to receive holy orders but the thought that to the daily celebrating of the holy sacrifice he would most efficaciously assist the suffering souls in purgatory. On their part, the souls who had received so many suffrages appeared to him several times to thank him or to recommend themselves to his charity. He lived near Pisa, entirely occupied with his spiritual exercises, when one Saturday during the night he saw in a dream a soul in pain, 
who besought him to celebrate Holy Mass on the following morning for her and several other souls that suffered most terribly in purgatory. Nicholas recognized the voice, but could not distinctly call to mind the person who spoke to him. I am, said the apparition, your deceased friend at Palangrino, del Isimo. By the divine mercy, I have escaped eternal chastisement by repentance, not so the temporal punishment due to my sins. I come in the name of many souls as unfortunate as myself to entreat you to offer the Holy Mass for us tomorrow. From it we expect our deliverance, or at least great alleviation. The saint replied with his usual kindness, May our Lord design to relieve you by the merits of his precious blood. But to this Mass for the dead I cannot say tomorrow. I must sing the conventional Mass in choir. Ah, uh, at least come with me, cried the departed soul, amid sighs and tears. I conjure you, for the love of God, come and behold our sufferings, and you will no longer refuse. You are too good to leave us in such frightful agonies. Then it seemed to him that he was transported into purgatory. He saw it an immense plain, where a vast multitude of souls of all ages and conditions were a prey to divers' tortures, most horrible to behold. By gestures and words they implored most piteously his assistance. Behold, says Polingerino, the state of those who sent me to you, since you are agreeable in the sight of God, we have confidence that he will refuse nothing to the oblation of the sacrifice offered by you, and that his divine mercy will deliver us. At this pitiful sight, the saint could not repress his tears. He immediately betook himself to the prayers, to console them in their sorrow, and the following morning went to the prior, relating to him the vision he had, and the request made by Pellerangino concerning the Mass for that day. The Father Prior, sharing his emotion, dispensed him for that day and for the rest of the week from saying the conventual Mass, that he might offer the Holy Sacrifice for the departed and devote himself entirely to the relief of the suffering souls. Delighted with his permission, Nicholas went to the church and celebrated Holy Mass with extraordinary fervor. During the entire week, he continued to celebrate the Holy Mass for the same intention, besides offering day and night prayers, disciplines, and all sorts of good works. At the end of the week, Plurangino again appeared, but no longer in a state of suffering. He was clad in a white garment and surrounded with a celestial light, in which he pointed out a large number of happy souls. They all thanked him, calling him their liberator. Then racing towards heaven, they chanted these words of the psalmist, Thou hast saved us from them that afflict us, and thou hast put them to shame that hate us. The enemies here spoken of are sins, and the demons who are their instigators. Chapter 14 Relief of the Holy Souls Holy Mass, Father Gerard the Thirty Masses of St. Gregory. Let us now consider the supernatural effects of a different kind, but which prove no less clearly the efficacy of the holy sacrifice of the Mass offered for the departed. We find them in the memoirs of Father Gerard, an English Jesuit and confessor of the faith during the persecutions in England in the 16th century. After relating how he had received the abjuration of a Protestant gentleman married to one of his cousins, Father Gerard adds, This conversion led to another under the most extraordinary circumstances. My new convent, convert went to see one of his friends who was dangerously ill. This was an upright man detained in heresy more than illusion, more by illusion than by any other motive. The visitor urgently exhorted him to be converted and to think of his soul, and obtained from him the promise that he would make his confession. He instructed him in everything, 
taught him how to excite himself to contrition for his sins, and went to seek for a priest. He had great difficulty in finding one, and in the meantime the sick person died. When about to expire, the poor dying man asked frequently whether his friend had not yet returned with the physician whom he had promised to bring. It was thus he called the Catholic priest. What followed showed that God had accepted the goodwill of the deceased. The nights following his death, his wife, a Protestant, saw a light moving in her room, and which came even within the curtains of her bed. Being afraid, she desired one of her servant maids to sleep in her room, but the latter saw nothing, although the light continued to be visible in the eyes of her mistress. The poor lady went for a, the friend whose return her husband had awaited with so much anxiety, related to him what had, ha what had happened, and asked what was to be done. This friend, before giving an answer, consulted a Catholic priest. The priest told him that the light was, for the wife of the deceased, a supernatural sign by which God invited her to return to the true faith. The lady was deeply impressed by these words. She opened her heart to grace and in her turn was converted. Once a Catholic, once a Catholic, she had mass celebrated in her chambers for some time, but the light always returned. The priest, considering these circumstances before God, thought that the deceased, though saved by his repentance, accompanied by the desire of confession, was in purgatory and stood in need of prayers. He advised a lady to have mass said for him during thirty days, according to the ancient custom of English Catholics. The good widow followed his advice, and on the thirtieth day, instead of one light, saw three two of which seemed to support another. The three lights hovered over her bed, then rose heavenward, never more to return. These three lights appear to have signified the three conversions and the efficacy of the Holy Mass, sacrifice of the Mass, to open heaven to the departed souls. The thirty masses, which were said for thirty consecutive days, is not an English custom only, as it is called by Father Gerard. It is also widely spread in Italy and other Christian countries. These masses are called the thirty masses of St. Gregory, because the pious custom seems to trace its origin back to this great pope. It is thus related in his Dialogues, Chapter 4, Book 4, Chapter 40. A religious named Justus had received and kept for himself three gold pieces. This was a grievous fault against his vow of poverty. He was discovered and excommunicated. This salutary penalty made him enter into himself, and some time afterward he died in true sentiments of repentance. Nevertheless, St. Gregory, in order to inspire the brethren with a lively horror of the sin of avarice in a religious, did not withdraw the sentence of excommunication. Justice was buried apart from the other monks, and the three pieces of money were thrown into the grave, while the whilst the religious repeated altogether the words of St. Peter to Simon, the magician, Keep thy money to perish with thee. 
Some time afterwards, the holy abbot, judging that the scandal was sufficiently repaired and moved with compassion for the soul of justice, called the procurator and said to him sorrowfully, Ever since the moment of his death, our brother has been tortured in the flames of purgatory. We must, through charity, make an effort to deliver him. Go then and take care that from this time forward the holy sacrifice be offered for thirty days. Let not one morning pass without the victim of salvation being offered up for his release. The procurator obey, obeyed punctually. The thirty masses were celebrated in the course of thirty days. When the thirtieth day arrived and the thirtieth mass was ended, the deceased appeared to a brother named Copiusus, saying, Bless God, my dear brother. Today I am delivered and admitted into the Society of the Saints. Since that time, the pious custom of celebrating 30 Masses for the dead has been established.